So uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Stefano, and I'm working currently at Houston Methodist Research Institute for the Orthopedics and Sport Medicine uh, Department. And I'm doing my PhD in, um, in the development of a cartilage and chip model for the study of a specific disease that is uh, osteoarthritis. And uh, on the same path, I'm also um, trying to find a new artificial ECM, so a new solution for cartilage uh, for condorcet encapsulation within the cartilage on chip platform. So uh, <laughs> is a little bit of background. I would like to give you a little bit of background regarding the disease because organ on chip uh, are developed uh, essentially for two main aspects, uh, to treat uh, um, for drug screening purposes and to treat some specific disease. So trying to recapitulate some characteristic of specific diseases. In my case, I'm focusing my attention on the um, developing on the development of a, a new organ on chip paradigm that is a cartilage on chip one. So to study osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis that, uh, is a whole joint disease because it's a degenerative disease. And I think and I bet that uh, I lost a lot of you have uh, known maybe someone that uh, is affected by this kind of disease because uh, it's the single most common cause of disease, uh, cause of disability in older adults, and uh, and it, it has a high incidence because uh, just in the United States uh, it affects more than 55 millions of uh, of uh, adults. I will focus more more, more my attention on the knee, so on the osteoarthritis uh, at the joint side of the knee because. Uh, Usually, since I'm a, um, I was a soccer player, I more focus on the development uh, of osteoarthritis uh, after a trauma, so post-traumatic osteoarthritis. What about the, the joint? So the joint is composed by three main uh, components, uh, the articular cartilage, the synovium, and the osteochondral interface. And this is a compartmental structure, and it's really important to understand each uh, um, each actor that is involved in the, in, the, in the joint itself. So starting from this, uh, we know that it's a degenerative disease, uh, osteoarthritis, and we need to find a cure for it because right now there are no cure available. And uh, because we have a lack of both therapeutic products and also of traditional uh, models, in vitro models and animal models. Because uh, the traditional models uh, lacking uh, the, most the most critical issue is that the lack of uh, complexity, while the animal models, even if they are able to recapitulate the joint complexity, to reproduce it, the problem is there are a lot of differences, uh, as you may know more than me for sure, <laughs> uh, among animals and the uh, high uh, variability between animal and animal and also ethical problems that are, are really concer concerning right now. So talking about the in vitro osteoarthritis models, uh, uh, we have the traditional one that are based on a 2D substrate and the is osteoarthritis is induced uh, through the administration of pro-inflammatory factors. Of course, we have a fast response to the provided stimuli, but we have a lot of criticalities, uh, including uh, we are talking about a macro scale uh, model. So it results in a non-homogeneous cold ring condition. And we have also a uh, different behavior observed compared to 3D models. The new technology that are being developed right now are including also organ on chip. These are belonging to the category of uh, innovative 3D models. And uh, osteoarthritis in this case is induced through mechanical stimulation. So no more administration of pro-inflammatory factors to induce it, but uh, uh, through mechanical stimulation. And uh, this can lead to the dramatic reduction of reagents and media required and the minimization of cell number required. That is something, okay. especially if you work with the primary exactly. cells, that is really interesting. And of course, uh, since we are talking about a mac uh, micro scale model, because uh, the model that you can see here on the right, right hand side, it has the dimension of a two centimeter by two, you have a better control over the cell microenvironment. Of course, since we are talking about cutting edge technology, it's not a standard. And of course, we have a limited throughput because in this case, the model that I depicted here is just a single chamber. So the aim of my project is to a building upon this, uh, this model that was developed by the group that I work with at Polytechnic of Milan in Italy is to increase the throughput. And basically the journey that I'm doing right now is to 
First of all, design and fabricate the mid-throughput cartilage on chips. So with my group at Polytechnic of Milan in Italy, we decided to exploit this feature of the single, cell, cell, um, the single chamber um, device to increase the throughput, so increase the number of chamber within the device. And uh, then I had the possibility to come to Houston and uh, we are trying to develop uh, and synthesize an, um, another thermoresponsive hydrogel for condos encapsulation. This thermoresponsive hydrogel would be then injected within the device, and then we will study the hydrogel biocompatibility. And this is more or less the overall overview of my, of my project. So <laughs> starting from the, maybe the most boring one because it's the most engineering one, so <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> bore you, but uh, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the, what we have uh, done for the design process. So the main objective was to increase the throughput of the cartilage and chip model for drug screening purposes mostly. And uh, since we are talking about uh, uh, several chamber altogether, we would like to give them an independent, uh, let's say space. Uh, so we don't have to, we don't want to have a cross contamination between each chamber. So the idea was to add a, a valve layer. And as you can see here, there's a schematic of the three different layers that have been developed uh, exploiting soft lithography technique. So the first uh, layer is the top one and it's called actuation layer because uh, as I told you before, I we would like to induce arthritis traits uh, thanks to a mechanical stimulation. So the actuation layer will do the, the mechanical part. Then the middle layer is the valve layer to avoid cross-contamination. And finally on the bottom in blue, you can see the chamber layer where we will seed the cells within the chip. Talking about, I would like to describe a little bit more each layer. So starting from the actuation one is formed by six different chamber and the positive pressure is provided to exert a mechanical stimulation to the cell canister. And then the valve layer, as I just mentioned, is inserted to avoid cross-contamination. And we are exploiting a system of thermal-like um, closed valves so that uh, thanks to the application of a negative pressure, we are able to lift uh, the walls that are interposed between each colder chamber. Each chamber, as you can see here on the right, has uh, composed, uh, the layer is composed by six different cha uh, chamber. And uh, as you can see here, there are a the little bit of a, let's say a gap that is in white, and this one are the wall that have been that uh, has to be lifted uh, from the valve layer. As you can see here, we have three different channels. The first one is the central one where we will seed the cells uh, with the hydrogel, and the two flanking lanes that you can see here are for media replenishment. And the peculiar characteristic of this specific device, and this and that is why it's called cartilage and chip is because it has also two different arrays of, uh, of pillar. And these pillar are really important because they can give us cell, uh, gel confinement, cell guidance, and also, of course, uh, exert a confined compression. That is the final aim of our, our work. So in, uh, in conclusion for this part, <laughs> uh, I would like to give you a little bit of a, um, let's say a schematic of the final configuration because uh, we have to build uh, our own device uh, with these three different layers, one upon the other. And the first one is the actuation, the second one, the valves, and finally the colder chamber. And uh, all these layers are bonded together permanently with the uh, hair plasma treatment. There is a specific treatment that uh, leave, uh, let's say, reactive the surfaces and it's able to bond them together and uh, indefinitely. After that, I would like to give you a little bit of a schematic of the injection process because uh, maybe it's a little bit, uh, let's say, abstract. And now I would like to give you a little bit of an insight of what is going on. So here, there's a, uh, there's a section view. And as you can see here in yellow, we have the gel that is uh, injected within the device. Starting from the application of a negative pressure, as you can see here, the valve layer are able to, um, to lift the walls and then uh, uh, it's possible to inject uh, in just one single, uh, single injection the whole chambers with just one injection of the, of the hydrogen with uh, embedded with loaded with cells. And this is uh, something really interesting that uh, is driving us a little bit crazy because uh, it's a little bit uh, tricky to obtain the complete uh, uh, injection within all the, ch on the chamber. But uh, I will talk about it uh, a little bit later. 
of course, uh, uh, the last step that we performed was to evaluate also the mechanical stimulation that occurred uh, at the, um, at the micro scale level. So we had to evaluate uh, how the um, actuation layer was able to exert the specific compression that we want. So as you can see here from the graph, we applied a positive pressure of uh, 200 millimeter of mercury and we obtain a plateau at this, at, at this level. So we decided to use the 300 milligram, millimeter of mercury to exert a mechanical stimulation. So to exert a total compression of the, of the device. And uh, the, the boring part is finished. <laughs> I hope that you are all here still. And uh, after that, we decided also to uh, explore also the possibility and the feasibility to design and synthesize a uh, uh, thermoresponsive hydrogel for condensate encapsulation uh, within the chip. So our aim was to develop this new artificial extracellular matrix for to encapsulate the, the, uh, the chondrocytes. And uh, the sub aim was to, first of all, enhance biocompatibility and the mimicking the in vivo condition. And of course, ensuring the gel confinement, because as I told you before, we have three different channels and we want just the central channel to be confined. The gel can be confined just in the central channel. So the idea was to exploit uh, the characteristic of a pluronic based hydrogel, this is a thermoresponsive one, with the addition of chondritin sulfate and dopamine, and in another case also hyaluronic acid and dopamine. So essentially two iteration of two different uh, formulation. And uh, of course, we have to bear in mind that there are some criticalities because uh, when you are entering the, in the world of hydrogel and specifically thermoresponsive hydrogel, you need to take into account a uh, few criticalities. The first one is this is a fast gelation process. So we have technical issues during the injection. As a second uh, uh, criticality, we have viscosity issues because uh, gel confinement is not, a, is, not, uh, is not simple to obtain. It's not easy to obtain because uh, gel confinement can be halted by the viscosity of the material. And finally, biocompatibility, because first of all, is the first, uh, first aim is to don't harm the cell construct. So starting from the main components, uh, we use the three different components, let's say, the pluronic for the thermogelation properties, that soil gel transition occurs uh, when the temperature increase. And then uh, for biocompatibility, we use chondritin sulfate, chondritin sulfate or hyaluronic acid, uh, because both of these, um, uh, and mo molecules are highly present within the cartilaginous uh, ECM. And finally, dopamine to increase the, ad the adhesiveness and mechanical properties. Uh, but before proceeding with the rheological characterization, uh, we need to understand first uh, how soil gel transition is measured. So how is it possible to measure these characteristics? So first of all, I would, I would like to give you an in a, a brief uh, overview of the things that are involved here. So each material possess um, peculiar mechanical properties. And depending on its morphology, we have three different categories. Because uh, if we are talking with uh, force uh, of solids, we have elastic materials. If we are talking about viscoelastic materials, we are talking about a liquid-like or a jet-like uh, material. And finally, viscous materials are the liquids, so essentially water and uh, stuff like this. And uh, in our case, uh, since we are talking about a hydrogel, we are talking about a thermoresponsive one. So it belongs uh, to the viscoelastic, viscoelastic category. But of course, uh, it's, a, it's a weird word maybe for someone, it's a complex word, but it's really easy because we are surrounded by viscoelastic materials um, on a daily basis because uh, after each meal, or I hope at least in the morning, <laughs> we use the toothpaste for brush our teeth, or we use mayonnaise or other sauces in our burger, or also honey, honey or, or maple syrup. So viscoelastic materials are surrounding us, uh, literally. And uh, how do we measure the mechanical properties of this hydrogel? Because uh, uh, since I'm talking about a thermoresponsive hydrogel, it has a different behavior according to the temperature. So it's a temperature dependent one. And uh, we need to use a particular instrument that is uh, called the rheometer that is able to measure the characteristic, the peculiar characteristic of uh, the hydrogel itself uh, with um, temperature increase or also decrease according to the temperature. But uh, which parameter are measured by, by a rheometer? Since we are talking about viscoelastic, uh, we have two different words 
let's say, in the same world. Uh, so viscous, uh, visco, the, the, the part of viscoelastic, the viscous is uh, regarding the loss modulus. So the viscous part is described by G double prime, while the elastic properties of the material are described by G prime, that is a storage modulus. So it describes the elastic part of the material. And since uh, we are talking about uh, thermal responsive hydrogel, the sol gen transition occurs when G prime is equal to G double prime, basically when the viscous part is equivalent to the elastic part. In this case, we have a, a transition from a solution to a gel. Building upon this, uh, we started uh, with two different biomimetic hydrogels. So as I told you before, chondritin sulfate and pluronic uh, called the CAR term and hyaluronic acid and pluronic called HPL. And we also we made some iteration, some, some dilution in PBS, as you can see here. Uh, we evaluated the, the properties and how temperature affected the G prime, the G double prime, so the viscous and the elastic behavior of the gel. And uh, we, we wanted to evaluate when we had the transition temperature, so when G prime was equal to G double prime. And as you can see here, I drew a line just to understand the, at which temperature we had this uh, uh, transition temperature. So when we had uh, the transition in the behavior from uh, G prime to G double prime. So the crossing over point, essentially this transition temperature. So when from a solution, it behaves like a gel. And as you can see here, it's really interesting to understand, to, to see that uh, also G prime, G double prime. So the stiffness of the material is higher for the original formulation, so in green, carton, and uh, HPL, and then the stiffness decreases uh, with the different dilutions. And uh, we wanted also to render it easier to understand, also to evaluate at 37 degrees the final behavior of, of the solution, of the formulation. And we had a gel-like behavior. So G prime was uh, higher, so it was greater than G double prime. So the storage modulus was greater than the loss modulus. The elastic part was uh, greater than the, the, um, the viscous part. And as you can see here, is in accordance with what we found for uh, with the temperature run. Mm, then we performed an injection assessment since this is what just a preliminary part uh, because we developed this, uh, this gel, but we didn't know if it was feasible to inject it within the chip. And as you can see here, it wasn't because <laughs> Here, the carton just showed uh, an insufficient success rate during the injection test because we had uh, no confinement within the central channel and leakages in the flanking lanes. So the main hypothesis was that maybe complex viscosity forced the gel out of the, of the central channel. So another parameter, not just only G prime and G double prime, but also the viscosity had to be addressed, so had to be investigated. And we did other temperature run tests, uh, focusing our attention on the viscosity of the material. And as you can see here, carton gel and the HPL showed uh, a higher complex viscosity, both at low temperature and a high temperature. And uh, we decided to give a shot to the dilution one-to-one. -one. It is the one that uh, has the lowest uh, complex viscosity, especially at low temperature and also at higher temperature. But since it's a problem of uh, viscosity, we decided to run and to run our test at low temperature, so with the gel at low temperature, because we, we thought that we could have the, the greater results. So what we did was to try to inject the carton gel dilution one-to-one, -one, and uh, we obtained a, a confinement, successful confinement in 75% of the cases, and uh, we could say that viscosity affected the injection feasibility. Although injection needs to be performed at a low temperature. So this is an issue because uh, if we are talking about a gel loaded with cells, uh, we can have a thermal, uh, let's say a thermal shock to cells that is given to cells. So we need to be careful to it, with, with it. And uh, moreover, since the transition temperature of the dilution one-to-one -one uh, occurs at 36 degrees Celsius, so we are pretty close to body temperature, is not easy to uh, deal with uh, this cartilage and chip while we use it uh, in the incubator and we have to take it out for media replenishment. And in this case, the risk is that uh, whenever you change the media, you can, uh, in theory, wash out the whole construct. So it's something that we have to bear in mind. Finally, we had to decide and we have to investigate it. We had to investigate the biocompatibility of the hydrogel itself. And to do so, 
we evaluated the viability with the um, with the live Z assay and the current MJ, the dilution one to one, showed a higher biocompatibility because we are talking about the order of ninety percent and uh, with a standard deviation of plus minus five percent. So we were pretty pretty um, let's say happy about these results. So at least it was biocompatible and also injectable. This is something that uh, I wanted to show you also because uh, we have a Michela, Michela that is forming here and the cells that are kind of aggregating there. And from there, they are spreading and trying to find uh, a way, uh, their own way. So it's something that, uh, mm, let's say we are glad to obtain these kind of results, uh, preliminary results. So as a future direction, in conclusion, uh, we want to optimize current gen HPL gel because uh, as I just mentioned before, we have to decrease the transition temperature. And uh, of course, a mechanical characterization and an evaluation of the mid throughput device will be investigated since we are just uh, at the beginning because we have designed the chip, we have designed and synthesized the hydrogen, and then we need to understand if it's working uh, the compression at the in all the chamber, not just in one chamber. And finally, after the stimulation, we want to check also the gene expression of uh, serotonin markers from healthy donor and post-traumatic um, patient for understanding if we are able to develop also the same response uh, in our chip, the, the, the mid throughput chip. And finally, the final aim, the, 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 the biggest one is to use this device for drug skin purposes. And uh, uh, with that, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention and uh, I would be more than glad to answer any question that could arise. Thank you.